You're listening to Parasearch Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Parasearch UK Radio. Parasearch Radio, broadcasting to the UK and beyond. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. You're listening to Kerry Greenaway and Mark Manley on the Dark Mirror Paranormal Show, only on Parasearch Radio. Good evening and welcome to the Dark Mirror Paranormal Show. My name is Kerry Greenaway and as always on a Friday, I am joined in the studio by the lovely Mark Manley. Good evening, Mark. Good evening. How the fair devil are you? My <laughs> gorgeous curves. It's that lovely you know it. quintessentially English voice. Oh, sorry. Oh, I guess yeah, I do. You are now. <laughs> <laughs> And the other lovely co-host with me tonight is the lovely Kaz Rooney. Good evening, Kaz. How are you tonight? Good evening, Kerry. I'm great, thank you. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well. Fallen off the table. I'm just uh, nearly. I'm nearly off the table, but not quite. Oh, I um, Kaz because you're going to see that much of her. No, this is true. She turned her video off. She's turned her video off. Yeah, turned her video off. She's very good. Bless her. <laughs> so, my beautiful people, my beautiful people, um, last week on the Dark Mirror Show, we talked about spirit animals, didn't we, my lovely Mark? Because Kaz was off. We did week. talk about spirit animals, yes. And we mentioned a case called Geff the Talking Mongoose. Or Jeff, depending we on how We did, you and it. it was very strange how Geff the Talking Mongoose. Here, yeah, I'll tell you, before I forget. Yeah, you know we're talking about Gaff the Talking Mongoose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Compassimiracat.com. <laughs> <laughs> you got a Talking Mongoose, haven't you? And a biker mongoose, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, the fact that Harry Price and Gaff the Talking Mongoose always had a wall or a fence between them to talk. That's right. And this gap in the wall, wherever you spoke in the house, you it was good. Anyway, we, we had quite a look at this particular case last week in Spirit Animals. And it raised a thought in my head about um, a guy who was quite intrinsic in the paranormal field. In fact, so intrinsic that I don't think many people don't know who Harry Price is. Well, he did a heck of a lot of things. I mean... In his, some of his accolades were um, he broadcast a fire walking um, experiment. He did the first ever live broadcast from a haunted house, mm -hmm. um, amongst other things. And he also brought about the revival of the Ghost Club as well, didn't he? He most certainly did. He's an incredible character. And a lot of the practices that Harry did, um, set in kind of like stone even to this day, what we do today in the paranormal field. So I don't think that you can underestimate the influence that Harry Price has had on the paranormal field. He is a pompous person. I would like to put that out there. Um, however, the work he did in the paranormal field pushed it beyond what people had previously sort of done. Do you know what I mean? I I will say, yes, you're right. He was, I would say he's pompous, but when you look at the likes of Charles Dickens and that lot in the original Ghost Club, um, he took his form of investigating and he had an extremely open mind and he opened it up completely to, as you say, how pretty much most of us investigate now. And when you compare it to the Victorian collars and, I oh, there, Sydney, and look, Toffee Chris Rapper coming down from the lampshade. Um, <laughs> Well, 
so I thought it was worth having a look at the lovely Harry. Now, Kaz, ha have you, how, 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 how <laughs> have you come I'm across, oh out. my God, how have you come across Harry in your discoveries Ow. so far? How? Mostly. How? <laughs> Ow. It was born in 1881, by the time, by the way. Kaz? I think Mark has swallowed a Harry Price biography or something. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> no, there's been conversations backwards and forward. I've got to admit, I don't... You know me, I'm really bad at research. It's got to be something that pulls my attention. So. not the only one, love. So, I mean, there's been conversations in between various people about Harry, and that's basically about it, and YouTube videos. Did you watch the TV you... programme that was on? No, I, I don't. I didn't. I that saw was a, the first they did, No, there was a one-off show enough. about Harry Price, and it was really good. Hmm. I enjoyed it. Hmm. Nothing like the real thing, though. I did send you a YouTube link to actual real life and kicking at the time, obviously, Harry Price yes. um, earlier on. Yeah. And I actually was quite astonished at his thought patterns because my opinion of Harry Price pre-research pre and looking into various cases of him was actually quite ludicrous. I found him quite, from what I'd heard, I was like, really? Oh my God, why would somebody waste their time? And he comes across as quite a ludicrous character you know, investigating cases that people wouldn't even necessarily touch, you know, doing things that were very media driven. He was almost like the modern day, dare I say it, Zach Baggins. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the Victorian <laughs> Zach Baggins. <laughs> Zach Baggins with a terribly British accent. With an I'm telling British you, accent. Mr. Ghosty, I challenge you now, come forth. I ain't scared of thee. <laughs> I don't think they spoke with these and nows in the Victorian era. You know, he was a master musician. Master musician? Master magician. He was a master and magician, And he joined the yeah. Society for Psychical Research as well. Uh, well, he did. He most certainly did. There is so much to Harry Price. We're not going to be able to cover everything because he is such an amazing character in the paranormal. And if you don't know Harry Price and you're in the paranormal, then naughty. That's all I can say is you're very, very naughty because... Well, I do love the naughty, that paranormal woman. He's very, uh, you're very naughty if you don't know Harry Price. He oh, yeah, is Hello, one Harry. of the leading investigators into cyclical phenomena and actually made it his business to expose fake spiritualists. And he is very so well publicised regarding hauntings and research and thinking outside the box in regards to investigations. And I believe that the ridicule he receives in the media for some of his more way out cases is absolutely disgraceful considering the work he has done in the paranormal field. My opinion on this guy has changed considerably since I've researched him. Ha! Let me tell you a little story about him when he was 15. <laughs> Please don't ruin it. Go on, carry on. <laughs> oh, I'm terribly sorry! <laughs> Hang on. Right. When he was 15, it was his first ever investigation. Ooh. Know that? Did you know that? Look, finish your drinking your wine, love. Do you know that? I did know that. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Well, here we go. He and a young friend obtained permission to spend the night in an old manor house that was rumoured to be haunted. Um, they experienced at the time disembodied footsteps in the house and attempted to photograph the ghost. But bear in mind that this was back in the uh, 1920s. Um, basically, when he attempted to photograph the ghost, it failed because Price loaded far too much flash powder into his camera. So you can imagine he's gone to take a photo of the ghost and it's just gone, BAM! And all they've got is a big flash and nothing. But it was a, sorry, did a skater? Ah! On a haunted show. Um, and, uh, yeah, so he basically had a very good story to tell everybody when he was younger about the time he went to take a photo and ended up scaring the living Dallas out of everybody, including the ghost. Oh, how funny. <laughs> However, as having said that, we've all done this sort of thing on an investigation. I like walking out on people and saying hello very loudly and making them scared and go, ah! You didn't Sometimes. make me scared, you just made me jump. Well, same thing. It's not the same thing at all. 
God, Kaz, yes. back me up on this. Or a lot. It's, it, I did it's swear not. a lot. I did swear a lot. Anyway. <laughs> Arthur. <laughs> Uh, sorry, Arthur? Who the hell is Arthur? <laughs> Arthur, yeah, that's right. Mr. Arthur Price. Mr. Arthur Price? No, um, Harry Price claimed his birth was actually in Shropshire when actually he was born in London in Red Lion Square. And, uh, well, he actually came from quite a poor background and said he moved, like, said he came from Shropshire because it gave him more of a middle class background. So it kind of shows the pompousness. I say that quite because well I feel like I'm being disrespectful. And I don't mean any disrespect to this man at all. He did do well for himself, though, when he, did when he got married. He incredibly well. However, yes. now, this is one, one thing I would like to say. Anybody, anybody who thinks they can get rich from the paranormal, learn a lesson from the fantastic Harry Price. He never became rich from the paranormal. He continued working for a paper merchants um, as a salesman um, throughout his life. So he did his normal work and he then did paranormal investigations and psychological research in his spare time. So he never actually gave up his day job. Yeah, this is very true. And to be absolutely yeah. honest, if you do become rich um, through the paranormal, then and this is going to be a controversy. If you're becoming rich through the paranormal... Charlatan, that's all I say. Charlatan. Or TV these days. Or TV, yeah, I can say yeah. you could be the next British sack baggins. Mr. Ghosty, I'm not afraid of you. My Actually, accent should surely... It wouldn't be ghosty, it would be demon. <laughs> demon! No, no, Zach, it's a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Kaz, what... Yes. Uh, oh... Opinion on Harry? Um, You have to give credit to him. You really do have to give credit to him. Come on, you do. I agree. But he is pompous. He is very pompous. But when I watched that, that clip that I sent to you guys, what struck me was although he's pompous, he was so typically that era. Yeah. Quintessentially English, born at the end of the 18th century, so still when you had the Victorians, and you had the big surge in paranormal and gothic horror, and you had all the fakes and the charlatans. You did, but you, if you, you know, you could imagine in a room Harry Houdini, Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, Harry Price. I'd yeah. love to have been at that I'd one. I'd love to could have been there. Could you imagine? <laughs> could you imagine? And these are the kind of people that would get together. Yes, there was rivalry between these guys. But could you imagine? Be amazing, wouldn't it? It would be fantastic. But you can imagine that the heated discussions that were going on in the background, because there was a huge rivalry between all of these gentlemen, um, and that's how you could class them. Oh my gosh, sorry, I forgot to put my phone on silent. Um, that is really what you have to. Rem- oh no, that's location. Mute. <laughs> Press the right buttons tonight. Sorry, guys. <laughs> that is what you have to remember about this: is that you can imagine the heated discussions. And yes, now we look back in time, we can think, "God, that would have been awesome." But they would have been people just like me and you back in the day, just working towards the paranormal and doing research, and you know, working towards it. But Harry Price. To be fair, they probably had better pronunciation and all sounded like Sherlock Holmes. Could you imagine it these days? It would probably be like, oh, man, that's <laughs> sick. <laughs> oh, God, no, I can't stand that. No. No, it's like when they start saying things like, you know, all the Essex estuary speak and the London estuary speak. I, can't, I bloody hate that. Oh, like the mocking the accent. Instead of having a proper, cool, blimey, governor. Well, really bad accent or Chaz and Dave accent. And they all start trying to speak like with that fake Jamaican accent. I hate, oh, that's not London. No. I'd, to be fair, I don't think they'd let us in. I think we would need to up our pronunciation game and um, be probably part of a university. I know somewhere. how to speak the Queen's However. English, damn it. Don't, don't be sorry if you don't. Now, Harry Price was born in 1881 on the 17th of January and he died on the 29th of March in 1948. And in that time, he had such an influence on the paranormal. So first off, we're not going to do a biography of Harry because, well, you can find that out wherever, really. We're going to have a look at some of Harry's 
you know, some of his cases. I thought we'd have a look at some of his cases. Now, one of his most fam famous cases, which I absolutely am fascinated by, is the Joanna Southcott box. He was in Joanna Southcott's box? Whoa. Joanna Southcott's box. Now, Joanna Southcott was um, a prophet who allegedly had made up several boxes and this was supposed to be prophetic and she one of these boxes was saved by one of her employees and said do not open it the only time it should be opened is in the company of a set amount of like bishops and only in a time of national need so the expectation on this box was huge It's all gone quiet. I was being molested by a cat, so... Uh, <laughs> so the, bo the box was only to be opened? Yeah. I've heard about these boxes. There's a, there's a few other boxes by a couple of other um, uh, famous mediums as well, if I remember rightly. And there is a special name for them, and I can't remember what it is, but it's... I would like to say it's the PM's box, but knowing the PM we got at the moment, I really don't want to go near that part of her body. Um, there was also... <laughs> There was also a few others. There was Eleanor Zugan as well, wasn't there? Yeah, but and, yeah, let's have a look. And at the Joanna. Countess Vasily Oh Why? Wow. Why was the box only to be opened in national crisis and in the presence of twenty-four bishops? Because it was supposed to hold in this box something that would save the nation. Okay, that's what that that's what it was billed as. That's what it was said as. And there were great lengths of this box. I mean, it was protected for a long time. And then when the guy who ended up having it um, died, he well, no, he was actually moving abroad, I believe. And when he moved abroad, he actually sent it to the SPR saying, look after this because this is, you know, what it's supposed to be. Now, well... I'm looking at it now, actually. It's a fascinating box. Now, Harry Price took this and was like, I'm very interested in this. I'm going to have a look at this. And um, bearing in mind, when this box was sealed, Joanna Southcott did not have the technology we had when Harry Price received this box. And because of how Harry Price works, he said, well, I don't have to open it to see what's inside it. You know? He actually did it. He went about it the right way. He did a really good job with that. He did an amazing, an amazing, amazing mm. job of this. Um, and this is how this is how his mindset works. He says, I've got this box, I've got this technology, I know what I'm doing. So before we open this box, firstly, I'm going to look at this box. And he documents this box perfectly. We know exactly what it looked like from his description. From the I'm looking at a photo of it, of it, actually. We've got photographs of it. He then did all the mod... Or when I say modern, I'm not talking about like today's modern, I'm talking about Harry Price's okay. modern day kind of technology that he had um and he x-rayed it and then he thought this is a really good case for cyclical testing psychometry and he used psychometry on his box that interests me because how yeah. many people have got this book oh fuck it it's open oh sorry i swore <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Gentlemen, I'm so gentlemen, sorry. I apologise for that. Damn it, my bleep machine blew up. I do apologise. Oh my god. Kenny's born in the tone. Come on, girl, pull yourself god, together. I'm so you... sorry. We would have, yeah, but how many people have got the box and gone, let's open it? Let's just open the box. Yeah, I'm, I'm just always going to open my box. <laughs> you know, I mean, the temptation to just open it would have been huge. Oh, the temptations are a singing group. Let's stick with it, yeah? <laughs> So he gets this box and he uses some commentary on it and he uses several mediums, including including somebody who doesn't claim to have any abilities at all as a, well, I don't know what you would term it as, baseline? Would you use that as a baseline? I, I suppose back then you could. Back then you could, because you didn't really didn't have half the things that, you, that we, you and I would do or Kaz would do to do bass lines back then. You know, I mean, quite frankly, going boom, 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 boom. You can't do bass lines back then because they didn't have any good bass guitars. But, you know, you could use um, psychometry. 
Now, the Joanna Southcott box is a huge thing. It has had huge media attention at this point. So I suppose you have got to use, you know, do it in a scientific way. You have got to look at it in a more respectful way, I think is the expression. Do it like they do on the Discovery Channel, yeah. You know, I suppose you, you do have to do that. Now, so he got these psychics um, to do psychometry on this box. Now, what interests me is, right? <laughs> oh, goodness me. Various, and he used not just one, he uses several, um, several of them. Now, a lot, there were a lot of themes that they all came up with, wasn't there? There is. I'm actually looking at the letter that went along with the box when it was given to Joanna Southcott, and it is very, very, um, very well spoken, let's put it that way. Would you like me to read it a little expert? Go on, do that for me. Oh, sir, it is with some diffidence that I venture to send you the box herewith. As I am not sure that your society will be interested in or will welcome the gift, the box in question belonged to the rigid religious visionary and sectary Joanna Southcott and undoubtedly contained some of her private property. I will ende endeavour to give you a history and pedigree of the box. That's a little bit. A little bit. Well, this box is... Uh, you know, as we've said, it's supposed to help her, the national, in, you know, times of trouble. In dire need, yeah. Yeah, in dire need. Now, the psychometrists came up with several impressions, and these are the common themes. Um, nearly every meeting... Can I give you an impression? No. Go on, I'll give you an impression. Scooby-Doo. Okay. That's next week. Nearly every <laughs> medium gave either manuscripts, writings, drawings, or books... Four mediums gave another box or a smaller box. Two sensed beads and two said seals in said box. Now, Joanna Southcott didn't just do one box. She did loads of boxes. Yeah. This is just only one of them. Now, at the time, Harry did put out a call in the national press saying, if anybody has another Joanna Southcott box, then if you want to open it at the same time, then come forward. But nobody came forward at that time. Okay. Um, with another box. But there is a movement called the South Coatians who allegedly have another box. Now, they're not going to open it. Probably because if they did and it had nothing in it of particular note... Then well, it had some initials on it. Society. <laughs> it had some initials on it, and it had some Latin on it, didn't it? It did, but that only was her name and the box. Oh nothing... yes, and it said Georgius the Third, D.G. Britannic, Britannarium Rex fit death. Mm. Rex is king, but I don't know what the rest is. When they X-rayed the box, certain objects were obvious as to what they were before they opened it. Yeah. Um, now they x-rayed it the pictures came out really really well um, and they had a good laugh at <laughs> some of the articles that were allegedly in this um, box and one oh of them, I've just seen a list yes exactly one of them was an old horse pistol that's right not cocked and not cocked a dice box a fob purse made of steel beads Coins were in a purse, a bone puzzle with rings, um, some books with a metal clasp, a painting or a miniature, a pair of gold inlaid earrings and a cameo or a worked pebble. Now, that's what the x-ray showed up. So they had an idea that the box wasn't containing um, information that would save the nation in dire times. <coughs> but Harry Price, bless him, did the best he could and contacted 24 different um, bishops to see if they would be interested in attending the official opening of said box. He did send letters to um, the Council of Bishops asking them if they would like to attend. Um, yeah. But to be absolutely yeah. honest, knowing what the... Um, I'm not going to poo-poo religion, but I myself have approached a few religious 
bishops and things in regards to investigations and they look at you like you just fell out of a tree so yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. i asked i actually did fi- try and get a um local reverend on to discuss religion in the modern day and its place on a show and had no joy with that either because it was yeah, a, they, 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 because they, it was a paranormal show the thing is i got told by by one bishop that um, they wouldn't let me investigate this particular place because it was investigating things that don't exist and aren't real. And my reply to that was, but you believe in angels. <laughs> or why do you do a certain amount of exorcisms? <laughs> and Holy Spirits. Know? And we're just investigating spirits and alleged use of, a, you know, alleged angels and spirits and this, that and the other. So, no. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Sorry? Anyway, back to the box. Yes. Let's get back to the box. <laughs> let's not get on the subject of religion, guys. Let's get back to Carrie's box. <laughs> yeah, let's get back onto the box. So, anyway, only one replied, which was the Bishop of Grantham. I don't even think he was a bishop, to be fair. Did he ever get beaten? Oh, I have no idea. But this guy did, did actually attend, and the press, obviously. And... When it was like opened and they actually found out what was inside the box, um, it was a bit of a letdown, really. I think. I think everyone was expecting, you know, something a little bit more. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm just looking at the letters he got back from um, the bishops. Most of the bishops he got <clears throat> who replied to him were the letters read it amusing or sarcastic or even rude. However, the Archbishop of Canterbury sent me a charming letter, which is of historical interest. Mm-hmm. And it was addressed on Lambeth Palace. So, yes. Exactly. It was a Bishop of London who turned up. <clears throat> Bishop of London replied that he tried to be present. Bishop of Derby hoped he could get a quorum for the opening. Uh, the Archbishop of York saw no reason why the box should not be opened. Um, and the Archbishop of Canterbury said... Uh, Approved the box being opened and said as speedily as may be. <laughs> just get yeah. on with it, basically. I think the church said, just do it. Yeah. Just get on with yeah. it. We, we, we don't buy into this. Um, just yeah. get onto it. But at least he tried to fulfil Joanna's, yeah. you know, like mindset yeah. regarding this. But the box didn't contain anything more. But I think what it did was it showed that Harry did try to be respectful to somebody's wishes. That's it the right way, yeah. He did try and do it in the right way, that he used the technology he had at the time to try to, um, you know, to research this box, you know, that he had a fair idea what was in it before he opened it, which is why he turned it into a media circus at the time. I think it shows how he methodically looked at this and documented this and actually try to use this as a really good tool to prove or disprove psychics, mediums, you know, whatever way you want to look at it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the fob purse was a green double-ended one, apparently. Ooh. Whatever a double-ended purse means, I don't know, but... You've got to remember the times, <laughs> the days and the age, but this seems almost like a memory box when, when you really Looking know at- what was in it. Yeah, have you seen the X-ray as well? Yeah, I mean, I have to say... The X-ray itself is fascinating. Yeah, the X-ray is fascinating. Quite an technology at the time. And this is the other thing that Harry Price does. He takes an idea and he thinks very scientifically about it. Now, when I was looking into him in regards to... um, He was looking at psychokinesis, where you move objects with your mind. Yeah. He has a table. Very gallus stuff. No, well, yeah, but in the table, it's like a cage. And inside this cage, in, within the table, is like musical instruments. Yeah. And then if you're doing a seance, your hands are on the table. You know no one can put their hands inside the table because you'd have to lift the flap up to, you know, do it. So this is basically an enclosed cage um, with musical instruments. So if anything is making the musical instruments work, he knows that nobody is interfering with that because they yeah. can't. Because they literally can't. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that fascinates me. The way he takes a concept and is able to make it so it's... Oh, I don't want to say foolproof because I think 
Well, yeah. he was one of the first guys to use the, the talc on the floor and flour on the exactly. floor and lop, yeah. uh, lopped off experiments. He would keep, he'd set the experiment up and then keep everybody away until the end of the, 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 the night and then come back and check it. Exactly. I mean, that is evident in the case of Rosalie when he looked at yeah. um, the ghost of, or the, you know, the ghost of Rosalie, when you look at the enigma of Rosalie, um, that's a book written by Paul Adams. Um, I went to the SPR for a talk um, on that, well, on the book launch of that. I've read that book. It is fascinating. And again, it's another one of those cases where you go, oh my God, that is portrayed. If you look at it modernised in today's eyes, you go, what the hell was he thinking? Basically, he felt a young girl in the dark, a real girl, young right. girl, in the dark. However, his methods at that time you take it back in time his methods of research he sealed that room he removed anything from that room he meticulously went through the house and then when this alleged activity happened he did what normal people would do and that's he took the pulse he felt the the manifestation do you know what i mean he <laughs> did what he needed to do if you haven't read Paul Adams' book on the enigma of Rosalie, then I suggest you do. We have done a show on it before under the spirit. No, sorry, Seventh Sanctum um, banner. Was that the Battersea Poltergeist, or was that different? No, that's something completely different. Um, right. Now, one of the other things that Harry Price was absolutely amazing at was debunking psychic mediums. Now, in particular, Helen Duncan Smith. I want to have a look at the case of Helen Duncan Smith. There are loads of others, but Helen Duncan was quite a big one. And when I went to this said book signing of um, The Enigma of Rosalie, Helen Duncan Smith actually had a picture on the wall at the SPL, which I was quite surprised about. Uh, before I forget, have you actually seen the uh, portrait of Rosalie? Yes, I have. It's actually... She was a very pretty young girl, but it's something quite uh, haunting about the picture. And that noise in the background is my dog. I'm terribly sorry. Winded <laughs> <laughs> the cat. Leave him alone. Now, Helen Duncan Smith was a medium uh, who was allegedly um, able to produce ectoplasm. Oh, that one! Right. Yes. Yes, yes. that one. Yeah. Go on. Well, <laughs> you've got to love Helen Duncan Smith. Now, she is, well, one of these cases where you look at it and you, you go, now, again, you look at it with modern eyes and you go, really? Um, but back in the day, you can imagine, you've got to remember the, the age, the Victorian it's, age. Sorry, I'm rustling paper left, right, and bloody seven. She the one who was known as Scotland's last witch. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, right. she was. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, she apparently could produce ectoplasm um, from her mouth. So what Harry did was he took her into the laboratory because he had a laboratory or laboratory. It was over 22 stone, you know. She was huge. She was a big girl. A big girl. Anyway... Helen Duncan Smith was able to produce this ectoplasm. So he took her into the laboratory and tried to recreate this within the laboratory. Now, bless her, she didn't like this so much. So when she was there, she reacted. She didn't. She didn't like it very much. She wouldn't be X-rayed. She created a scene. She ran out into the street. Her husband caught her and basically ruined the experiment. And whenever they did catch her um, producing this um, with their scissors and, you know, trying to grab a sample, all the samples were, were basically cheesecloth or um, paper that had been soaked in egg whites. He, oh, goodness me. She bas he basically debunked her. Wait, now, hang on, hold up, hold up. Yeah. Where the hell did she hold this stuff? I know she was a big girl, but her cheeks weren't that big. Her stomach. She regurgitated Oh, God, it. what, regurgitated it? Yeah. Disgusting. Harry Carry on, sorry. 
None yeah. of that's fine. Harry was very, very sceptical of Duncan and had her perform a number of test seances. Um, now, she was suspect. He, he wasn't stupid. He, he did look at this and go, I don't believe this is real, and I'm going to prove it. Now, um, as I Don't say, at one, when he wanted to x-ray her, she ran out into the street creating Mary Hell, basically. Her husband caught her. Now, that ruined the controlled experiment. This is this is the thing. He loved a controlled experiment um, because at that point he went, that's ruined. Because when her husband caught her, she could have passed whatever she was holding within yeah. herself to her husband. So that was that. Now... According to Price, at one of these particular um, experiments, um, he, he said, and this is a quote, the sight of half a dozen men, each with a pair of scissors waiting for the word, was amusing. It came, we all jumped. One of the doctors got hold of the stuff and secured a piece. The medium screamed and the rest of the teleplasm went down her throat. This time, it wasn't cheesecloth. It proved to be paper soaked in white of egg, and folded into a flattened tube. Could anything be more infantile than a group of grown-up men wasting time, money, and energy on the antics of a fat female crook? Oh, she was actually arrested. She was Very arrested for scathing. it. In 19, she was arrested for it in 1944 as well. She certainly was. Now, my goodness me, Price actually gave evidence at her prosecution and. You know, Helen Duncan Smith and her travelling companions, which was Frances Brown, Ernest and Elizabeth Homer, were prosecuted and convicted. And Duncan was jailed for nine months. You know what was unique about her court case? Tell me. She was the last person to be prosecuted under the Witchcraft Act of 1735. She yeah, she certainly was. was. Kaz? Yeah, she was. And this is Scotland's smallest white witch. <laughs> She's going to kill me when she comes round next week, aren't you? I'm going to kill you when I come round. <laughs> slap me round the back of my bald head. <laughs> I'm so glad you'll you hear did. it. You'll hear it in Cambiana from Yorkshire. You'll just hear the. I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> Kaz has been slapped. <laughs> hey, you're your stoner, Smack. <laughs> oh my goodness! See. When you look at Harry, I mean, I say, nowadays, with some of the cases he looked at, it was absolutely ridiculous. But I learned a valuable lesson about Harry Price, and that was never to discount his investigation techniques. Now, there was another case where he was looking at magic. He was a now, magician. bearing in mind, oh. he was a proficient magician. Now, he had been given a manuscript that allegedly turned a goat into a man but it you had to do certain things at certain times in the west country if you go around barns at a few uh, you know, on two o'clock in the morning after they've had some cider you can probably find a half goat half man thing going on but he did it if anything he did it to disprove it he also was into fakeerism as well or fakeerism what's that then the Indian rope trick, um, the, the walking on fire um, and suspended things and this, that. Suspended animation, that was it, and stuff like that. And he was one of the first people over here to do those tricks. But he got um, uh, people, from the, the fakirs from India to come and do it. And it was filmed and everything. Exactly. And he was looking not just at allegedly cyclical phenomena in regards it was- to... Exactly. No, exactly. The, the, the fire one. He was in well into the, the mind of a matter, and he'd been trying to prove that quite a long time. Exactly yeah. the psychology of it. So he wasn't actually as close-minded as I originally thought, or as bonkers as I originally thought. When I started looking at Harry Price, I actually was quite astonished by Harry Price and the methods he would go to. Now, in regards to investigations, he used to have a kit. A specific kit, didn't he? Kit. And I'm just trying to find his kit now because I was looking at it earlier and I was quite surprised. <laughs> I've completely lost it. <laughs> now, one of the Carry first things... Talking, don't mind me. Oh, OK. One of the first things that Harry Price suggested a paranormal investigator should have would be 
Soft soled shoes, so you didn't make noise or footsteps. That's a really good idea. That is actually because when you think about it, the amount of investigation we've gone to, and I've heard people with bloody great big cloth uppers on. I mean, I myself, I've worn Timberlands at things, and they go boom, diddy boom, diddy boom when you're walking along. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? So you could be as silent as possible. I mean, that is an amazing idea. It's basic, very basic idea, but it's an amazing idea, right? Because how many times? Oh God, this foot was. Did you hear that? Footsteps. And it could be yeah. when your investigators above you or in the next room or something like that, walking across with their great big clodhoppers. Sound carries in old buildings. Ah, I've got some of this yeah. stuff here. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mercury and... Um... Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm really bad because I usually wear boots. Boots. And they're usually noisy. <laughs> boots. Boots. <laughs> I can't say it again boots. for me. <laughs> I will get this Scottish accent down if it kills me. Oh, Can you say, it's doing up. You do try. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep trying. Now, I think that is an amazing idea. Um, now, he said that paranormal activity would be easier to detect if the researcher moved about as silently as possible. Now, he also used a flashlight with extra batteries. Duh. And <laughs> candles were also standard items to be used when investigating ghosts at night. The candles serve as a backup if the flashlights fail and they stood inside glass jars, obviously, for safety reasons. Like One thing, logical. One thing I would like to put my two penneth in about candles is the only ever time I've used candles on an investigation was uh, the Rye Gatehouse. Remember yeah. when we were upstairs? Yeah. And that was used, what was it? It was in a salt holder, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. A, a, a rock salt, was it quartz. rock salt? It was quartz. Quartz holder, and when certain questions were asked, that, that flame was being manipulated. manipulated. <laughs> yes, I remember that. Yeah. However, I also am very wary of that because where we were doing that was in front of a fireplace. Or it could have been somebody's breath on the flame, you never know. Or it could have been somebody's breath on the flame. So I do, I am very, very wary of that particular um, situation. Actually, <gasps> Ah, Tell you what, he was the first. He was the first man to invent a mercury switch, sort of. Ah. Now he also had a notebook, and he thought it was incredibly important to record every event immediately after it occurred. Time stamping. This is building a proper case study in regards to paranormal investigation. How many people do this? I can do that. I've got fingers up in the air. I'm pointing at my screen. <laughs> How many people do that on an investigation? Time stamp it. We rely so much on technology in these days. You do. Yeah. You do. And when we're recording stuff, what we normally say the time and stuff, because I know when I'm doing the videos, I say the time. However, the only time I carry a notebook around and write everything down is when I'm at my job doing security. I always have to write down every single bloody thing that happens. And that's what you should do on an investigation. Even though it's time stamped on your tech... You can't yeah. always rely that it is dead accurate. Whereas, you know, you, I mean, all right, okay, so you could argue a wristwatch is not necessarily accurate. However, time stamp it, but, you know, physically, do it into yeah. a notebook. Do that. This is one of the things that I love about Ashley Nibb's Investigator's Journal is this gives you a tool to use in your investigation, which... Sorry, yeah, carry on. It's kind of forgotten. No one does. It's kind of forgotten <laughs> in regards to investigating. But Harry Price brought this in very early <laughs> days of the um, very early days back in the Victorian era. Now, what else did he have then, Mark, in his paranormal investigators kit? He actually, Harry? Kept, he kept a sketch pad to make any drawings of any apparitions or alleged apparitions or shadows or sightings that were seen. Ah, he kept a bowl of mercury because it would detect tremors of any description or vibrations. Vibrations. <laughs> um, he kept a tape, or he kept tape, as in um, like sticky tape and cord, because if he was in a room and he wanted to be do like a lone vigil, he'd seal the room off completely so that nobody could have come in and uh, fake any... <laughs> Stuff. 
<laughs> get fingerprint brushes so that if anything had been touched, moved, poked, whatever, um, he could rule out outside interference. Um, Sketchpad drafting brushes so he could plot an entire house. Bandages and a portable telephone that worked between rooms to communicate with other investigators, as in modern, like our modern day walkie talkies that we use. Exactly. And, and when you look at this kit, that's not a huge amount. I mean, okay, so we don't carry mercury in a bowl, but that's a fair point. No, because I like to be healthy. But that's a fair point. A bowl of water would, would do the job, wouldn't it? We use REM pods, don't we? Oh, do we? Yeah, okay, we use REM pods. See, yeah. I'm not yeah. tech-minded at all. Let's just use a bowl of water. <laughs> How can you tell I'm the tech guy in the team? Mm. <laughs> I should have learned something She wants something to use a bowl now, of water. Oh, let's get a REM pod. I should have learned something by now, shouldn't I? Actually, to be fair, you've used similar. You know when we've gone on investigations and I've used that Simon Says um, app, which is oh. based on it's based on um, the uh, Mercury suite that's entire inside everything that controls direction. Mm. Yeah, that's that's what that is based on. It's based on the Mercury technology. It's an app, Mark. It's, but it, use, it incorporates the use of the Mercury technology. Oh, for God's sake. So would a barometer. So would a thermometer. <laughs> Sorry, I nearly broke the nib on my pen there. <laughs> Too hard. Carry on. I'll be taking my scroll and my, my quill pen this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, must I just lick the end before I put it in the ink? <laughs> I think some of his ideas are absolutely, back in the day, groundbreaking. He also had dowsing rods, which Kaz uses, and he also yeah. had a Ouija board. And he also used to use stones as well, which I think when they say stones, they mean quartz. As in you do. And another thing which I quite like because you do it, Kaz does it, and I've seen you use it, it's smudging. Only yeah. if smudging is fine if you're doing a clearance or yeah. you're using incense to help raise the vibration because certain um, herbs... I find changing the battery source vibration out. It is, but you, with that, you do have to be very, very careful because yeah. locations don't always like it. And if you're doing a clearance or a house clearance, there are other... It's not just as simple as just lighting your sage and walking around. There's there's a whole ritual that needs to be done with that. Um, yeah. I came across that at the weekend. I did an event last weekend, and that was one of the things that came out. Someone said, oh, I've saged my house, and nothing happened, nothing changed. So I was like... Did I, you, you know, do this? Talking to the lady a little bit more, and I, I realised very quickly that that's all she did was just sage it and expect it to be cleared. And there is so much more to it than that, isn't there, Kaz? Yes, there is. Can I... If you're on a location, to be no disrespect, you shouldn't be saging. Not without the location's permission or... Um... If you're at an abandoned chicken farm, try onioning as well. <laughs> <laughs> now, I will generally... After an investigation, when we're off location, I will sage pick our team. Yeah, I? yeah, and yeah, you do, and it, it's. Have you had that, Kaz? Has she, has she has she done a good old saging on you? Uh, no. What I usually do is I usually make everyone close down before they leave the location. Yeah, that's that. if we've been. Yeah, it's a bad location. That, you do the this saging is like as well, an isn't it? Extra. When we've left the location, I will then sage each individual person if they want yeah. to um, yeah. as well. That That's just like a personal thing. Only because yeah. I can work with that energy and clear any lingering um, effects from the investigation. That's a personal thing yeah. for me. Um, yeah. But if you don't want it, you don't have to have it. I think, you know, quite most of my the people I've worked with have loved that. It's, yeah, I, I like it, and I like it when we do investigations and it's been using the different things. It's like I've done an investigation with Kaz and I've seen how she does it, Don't, and we've done an investigation with you and I've seen how you do it. And I've, I like it when you do your things and you do your things with stones and then I'll do my stuff with the chi and then you've got other people doing their various forms and this, that, and the other. Yeah. Um, and I, I do like it when you do investigations and new things come along because you shouldn't be afraid to say, oh, yeah, you know. Oh, it's no, like Cass, totally tiny, tiny little person. She does, she does stuff very much like you. 
But when she brought the dowsing rods out, I was actually fascinated because every time I try and hold dowsing rods, one of them falls out my hand. But um, it was quite nice watching somebody else do it. Dowsing is inc- I actually think I love dowsing in a investigation. I think to link into earth energies, it's it's quite an effective tool. Yeah, Kaz. What else is quite an effective tool? I, I do. <laughs> I Can EMF me, Shut up, let Kaz talk. Mark, be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Kaz, speak up, you tiny person! Shut up, man. Right. Millions have got her! Dozen rods, dozen rods. I do love using dozen rods, but the, what actually happens when we ended up going, the investigation that Mark's talking about, I won't speak about it, but what I will say is there was someone there who picked up the dowsing rods and she was getting on so well with them, I gave her my dowsing rods. You <laughs> gave it to her. Yeah. I gave them to her. Because she was gobsmacked. Like, she was fantastic <laughs> with these dowsing rods. Budding, you've, got, you've got a budding investigator coming up there, I tell you. Oh, yeah, definitely. The thing is with dowsing rods, when my very first investigation I ever did, and this was with the public, um, this, is, yeah, this is before I was into all of this field, I just went on a public, they actually did a workshop with dowsing rods. It was incredibly interesting. And at the time, I couldn't get them to work at all. Yet one of my friends who was with me, oh my gosh, she was amazing. And they, what they did was they actually hid a set of keys on the location and told her to yeah. go and find these keys. And she... And he did, didn't she? And then he swore again. She, she yeah. did. And he did swear, did I did. I, oh, I nearly popped another sweary out there. She nearly said, and she pantingly <laughs> did, yes. And she did. She found them keys with these dowsing rods. Yeah. Um, one thing I was going to say. That was God. When I think about that, that was like a long time ago. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. I'm having cool. a flashback. <laughs> At least it's not flashed out, so you're not there going like that. And oh, I'm water that's ball later. Yeah. No. That's later. <laughs> it's not water, is it? Um, <gasps> what? It'd be ice oh, maybe. Anyway, Harry. Harry Price. Yeah. Total loss, I said. <laughs> we, went, we went off on a tangent, didn't we? We were supposed to be talking about Harry Price, Total. and he's done so much, and we just went off on a tangent about how we investigate. Oh, my God. Um, anyway, back on back on track. So looking at what he used in the field, <coughs> we can learn an awful, awful lot from Harry Price about how you build a case study in regards to investigation, how you break it down. Don't we agree? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, he, he basically did the guidelines that we all use these days. But another thing I meant to say was, do you know why he originally started exposing uh, charlatans? Tell me. Yeah, um, you know, in the history, there was a Spanish flu epidemic that wiped out thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Mm-hmm. Um, he had some relatives who got killed by it. He had some friends who had relatives who got killed by it. And he saw all these people coming out of the woodwork saying, I can get you in contact with your loved ones. Tell them that you fucking love them. Oh, cool, blimey, mister. It's after nine o'clock. I'm doing an accent. I'm in character love. Love you. (laughs) And and then he saw that going on, and and quite rightly so. He was there going, no, I don't like this. And fair play to the guy. He stood up, and and that's when he he started saying, no, it's fake. They're fake. This is fake. That's fake. You know? And, yeah, I quite agree with it. He did a good thing. I think he did. I think he he really opened up the doors to the scientific and the spiritual. He was open to the spiritual, but really, you know, broke those boundaries in regards to a lot of fake at the time. I don't think it was the Spanish civil war, uh, the Spanish flu situation. Wasn't there a war? There was an explosion regarding a war no, of spiritualism no, but the in the Victorian thing, era. Yeah, no, but the thing that kicked him off with getting incensed at these um, charlatans, was the ones that came out after the Spanish flu epidemic. I've just read it. Oh, okay. Was that on Wikipedia? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. If you want to know real facts, don't use Wikipedia, all right? Now, another thing that Harry Price is incredibly famous for is the Borley Rectory. We can't, we can't acknowledge Harry Price without looking at Borley Rectory. Borley Rectory used one of the first ever uh, haunted. 
um, episodes. Well, it's and not there anymore. <laughs> no, it's not. But if I remember rightly, um, Harry Price did, um, I'm sure he broadcast from there. Let's have a look. 1936. Yeah. He broadcast live on BBC Radio from Bawley Rectory. Wow. Mm. Now, if you haven't listened to my show with Ashley Thorpe, he has done a film on Bawley Rectory recently. That was on the spirit dimension. Have a listen to that. And if you can get a chance to catch the film, I certainly suggest you do because it is one of the most atmospheric brilliantly oh god it's awesome this film is awesome so the old house but going back to the the old house Mm -hmm. the old house um had dark deeds murder restless spirits sex and uh intrepid investigators there There was a heck of a lot went on and it was used in horror films as well oh gosh yeah it's an amazing case if you don't know the case of borley rectory then i suggest you definitely definitely look into that one now, my, one of my good friends, Eddie Brazil, who I adore, I absolutely adore, him and his wife. I know that name. I've always wanted to talk to him. Yeah. Oh, well, he's one of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> I, I go visit him and we go drinking. <laughs> <laughs> name dropper. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm name dropping big time. Now, he, in his garden, he's actually got the um, a stone that came from Borley Rectory. And he's got really? a bell on the outside of his house that came from Bottle Rectory. And, oh, my God, he is just Peter Underwood. He's got the whole, oh, oh my, honestly, I could talk to Eddie and Sue forever about paranormal. He is just so knowledgeable. And they, him and Paul Adams have written a book um, about the definitive guide to Bottle Rectory. So catch that because that is, if you haven't got it, get it because it is awesome. Did you know that uh, Harry Price actually rented Borley Rectory for a year? Yeah, I do. And it's a fascinating oh. case. That's where all the, the... I mean, we're not going to go into it here because, to be absolutely honest, it, that could fill a completely yeah, other show, show anyway. Yeah, we have done a but show on Borley. May 1937 to May 1938, he rented it, and that's when he did a lot of investigating. He did. As I say, if you if you don't know the case, look into that because it is fascinating. I have been to Borley. What do you get there? When I got there, I wasn't working spiritually at the time at all. I literally just sort of was like, uh, it was like a day trip. And I was like, oh, Borley, let's go and have a look. And the village is tiny. Um, the church is still there. The churchyard is still there. Um, but the rectory isn't. Okay. And the village isn't particularly open to sightseers. So you have to... You can't just, like, um, roll up with your cameras and your K2. You have to be a bit more subtle about it. But it is fascinating. The whole energy of that place is awesome. Um, I believe it sits on a ley line. Yeah. And at the time, we just did the church area. We didn't go down and try and find the rectory area. But I wasn't as knowledgeable then as I am now. And I really wish I'd taken a little bit more time now, several times, the really strange thing is, several times, myself, Andy Mercer, and um, Richard Clements has actually gone out to try and get to the village of Borley to have a little look ourselves. Um, we know it's nothing's there, but just to have a feel of the place. And every single time, we have been thwarted. We've not. That reminds me of a certain woods that we went looking for the fabled witch's hut in. And our compasses and GPS, every time you got vaguely near the place, they all went, no, and changed direction. That's right. It's very str- that? It is very, very strange. Um, and that's the same with Borley. Every single time we've set out to do it, we've not actually been able to get there. Um, but Borley in itself is a whole subject on its own, which no doubt at some point we will cover again because we have covered it before. We had Eddie Brazil on talking about it a little while ago. And I believe Paul Adams spoke about it. And Ashley Thorpe as well, who'd done the film recently. So, guys, check that out. We're actually coming to the end of the show, believe it or not. And we barely even scratched the surface of Harry. Poor old Harry. (laughs) At the end of the day, to recap, Harry Price is the whole reason that us as investigators do things in the way we do. And have our little rituals that we do and our tools that we use in every day. Um, investigating and 
be it, whether it be um, public investigations or private investigations, he was the guy that produced the recipe that we all follow by. Yeah, that is true. And he may have come from alien stock, but I don't know. <laughs> I do <laughs> I do actually get laughed at because I take talcum powder when I go on investigations. Oh. But I still okay. do that. I take coins and I take talcum powder. And I, yeah. I always do that. But a lot of people are flour, isn't it? Exactly. A lot of are, yeah. And these all come back from the, you know, come back. We always go back. I mean, we've not yeah. even talked about what Harry Price did in the seance room, really. You know, I mean, he set the modern day standard for seance room practices. He is just phenomenal. Guys, if you don't know Harry Price, <laughs> shame on you. Check it was much misaligned. It was much mis misaligned um, in the I past. I agree. I agree. Yeah. He's, he's almost like now. I'm fairly sorry. I agree. I say, when I started off in this journey of the paranormal, um, Harry Price had a media image of ridicule when he so didn't deserve that. Um, he definitely aligned the scientific along with the spiritual. And yes, he debunked a lot of things. Too right did he debunk. Too goddamn right is what I say. Yeah. Oh, I've got a soapbox man. Oh, my God. Must be that time of <laughs> night. I'm terribly sorry. We're back up in London. Would you, would you like a little bit more time in the speaker's corner? <laughs> no, I definitely think that he is very misaligned. And since I've course, looked yeah. into him... I actually think I have a lot more respect for this man. Now, anyway, we are running over and, and we could talk about Harry Price all night. Now, Monday night, we have no show. We're having a night off. No show on Monday night at all. I can't believe that. I've got a night off. Oh, why do I feel a pop-up coming along? Oh, no, 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 I'm out. I'm out and about on Monday night. I can't do a pop-up. I wasn't talking to you. Oh, well, if Paul's around, then maybe Paul will do a pop-up with you. I was talking to now, Kaz. Kaz, do you fancy a pop-up? Aye, can aye. You, can you do the <laughs> studio? Possibly. <laughs> I have the technology! <laughs> On Tuesday evening, the Paranormal Concept Show is looking at should we make money from the paranormal or psychic abilities? And we have got a guest called Denise Charlton on. Um, so we're going to be having a look at that one. That is a subject I feel quite passionately about. Now, on Haunted Histories, on Wednesday, we're looking at the Ashmore Estate. KTPF Reload Show on Thursday evening. Or is it? We may have a different show for you at 9pm on Thursday evening. <laughs> <laughs> Watch yeah. this space is all I can say. Uh, next Friday on the Dark Mirror Show, <laughs> <laughs> we are talking. Oh, God, I've talked the guys into this one. We are talking... Scooby Dee Wee Doo, where are you? Sorry. <laughs> I have told the guys into talking everything Scooby Doo. Um, a light hearted show next Friday evening. And anyway, this Sunday on the Spirit Dimension, this Sunday, that is the 26th of November, it is a special interview. A special. We've got a special for you guys. It is a special interview with Mr. Graham Phillips. Oh, fun size Mars bar. Okay. The editor and founder of Strange Parent, uh, Strange Phenomena, sorry, magazine. God, <laughs> Strange Phenomena magazine. <laughs> he has been the in the field for so many yeah. years. He has written about so many subjects. You need to join us for that one. I am on air at 9 p.m. with Mr. Andy Mercer on Sunday evening. And on that note, don't forget, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check us out on Facebook for our, your weekly updates on what shows are going live and when. <laughs> and share us with your friends. If you like what you hear, don't forget, help us spread the word to bring everything paranormal into your world. And on that note, I say good night, Mark. Uh, good night, and I will broadcast live with you from the mystery machine next week, won't we, Scooby? <laughs> <laughs> and good night, Kaz. Good night, everyone. Good night, Kenny. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and on that note, I say farewell and good night. I would have gotten Thank away with it listening. too if it hadn't been for Don't those Don't forget to kids. join us for more shows throughout the week. <laughs> Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and the World Wide Web. 
to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.